final installment of our All In series, week number three. It's just a three-week installment. Well, if you include the anniversary, which if you're new to Discovery and you haven't heard any of these messages in this series, I'd love for you to catch up. Start with our six-year anniversary because I'm kind of capstoning it today. And man, I, I, I'm, I'm sad to see it end because the stories that I have heard have just been amazing of, of those of you that are even you know, using the language, I'm going all in, and, and what that means for you. Just last Sunday, we had baptisms, and there were 17 people that went all in with baptisms just here at this campus. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus, you guys. Really awesome. I just love, I love hearing the stories, and so we've been kind of navigating through this concept of what does it mean to go all in, and we got one more story to kind of share with you today on uh, what that means, and what does it look like to go all in, and what are some maybe challenges for us to make that decision. Romans chapter 12 is our theme verse, the Apostle Paul um, kind of letting us know what all in looks like, and we've been sitting in this now for three weeks, and, and there's one more part of it that I want to show you and teach on today. So he says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. That's what all in looks like. It's just all of you. It's just your ordinary stuff, your everyday stuff. God wants it all. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And when you do that, you'll be changed from the inside out. And today, what I want to talk to you about and in this context of going all in with God is this statement right here. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. We're going to come back to that. Then he continues, unlike the culture around you, and we've talked about that, how culture pulls us on one arm. God in the Holy Spirit is beckoning us another way, and we feel the tension. Unlike the culture around you, always trying to drag you down to its level of immaturity, God is the one who's trying to bring out the best in you. And because he created you, he's the only one that can bring out the best in you and develop well-informed maturity in you. So how do we recognize? How do we recognize what God wants and then respond to it? So here's the million-dollar question for today. Okay, write it down this way. How do you know what God wants? It's a question I get in a lot of different variety of forms as a pastor very often. You may have asked that question yourself, maybe even today that resonates with a season you're going through. How do I know? How do I know what God wants? So right off the bat, I want you to know this. God, look, because some people think, well, God wants me successful. God wants me to be happy. God wants me to be, you know, secure in my life and stuff. Listen, Jesus did not die so that you could be safe. He died so that you would be dangerous. Amen, somebody, okay? That's why Jesus, Jesus died, you guys. So we, when we finish our service and we say, hey, go love God, love each other and change the world, we always end with our vision to go love God, love each other and change the world. I like to think that the devil gets scared out of his you-know-what because we're sending spirit-filled, on fire for God, believers in Jesus who are going out there to wreak havoc on the enemy. And that, so faithfulness is not about holding down the fort. Faithfulness is about invading hell holes with the love of Jesus. That's, that's what God, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says that, not in your notes, you guys, an extra one for you to write down, says that from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful people have been seizing it. Um, the missionary C.T. Studd, a famous missionary, said it best. He said this, some want to live within the sound of church or the chapel bells, but I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Amen. Oh, I like that a lot, man. That resonates with my spirit right there. Today, I want to help you understand, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what does God, what does God want? What does that look like? He's, he's asking us to follow, to go all in. Like, what is that? What does he want? What does that look like? To help us teach this today, I want to study another portion of scripture to someone who, who got the invitation, got the invitation to follow Jesus, but he did not respond. He did not, he didn't, he didn't go all in. He didn't follow Jesus. And, and, and today we're going to study the story of the rich young ruler and see what is God, what does God really want? And I think that a lot of us, a lot of us, we have this idea of, of what we think he wants, 
but we're going to discover today what he really wants. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, you guys, is where the story kind of begins of the rich young ruler. And it says, just then a man, and that's that rich young ruler we're going to be reading about, came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, notice what he says, what good things must I do to inherit eternal life? See, this rich young ruler was, was you're going to see, he's, he was obeying all the commandments, but he was still asking, what's missing, Jesus? What still is missing in my life? And I believe what was missing, you guys, is the risk, the danger, the, the sacrifice of father. Like on paper, this guy has everything that we think that we could ever want out of life. Um, and you don't have to go to seminary to exegete this one. It's right in the text. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. I mean, he had wealth, he had power, and he had youth, and he had it all. And he says, something's missing. What, 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 what am I missing here? He's obeying all the commandments, but he's, he's lacking. I believe he's lacking the holy adrenaline that happens when you commit to following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. When I read this account of the rich young ruler, I thought about this question. What does God really, really want then? And I, I think we think we think we know or we have an idea of what he wants. And, and I think a lot of people have it wrong and have the same maybe mindset of the rich young ruler. So, so write these down because I think that this wrong conception of, or misconception of what God wants from us is number one, that we think that God wants us to behave. He wants us to, to have good behavior, to follow a list of rules and to, and to act right. Notice the question again. He said, what good things do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, to have eternal life, to have the forgiveness of my sins and to, to be made right with God and have my eternal future secure, what good things must I do? This question is very interesting to me because it even starts off on the false assumption that eternal life has to do with anything that you could do, right. anything you could ever do. Are you tracking this with me, you guys? It's the wrong question. And if you ask the wrong questions, you're never going to get to the right answer. I think there's a lot of you asking like, like, what next? What's next for me? What else do I need to do? There is a common misconception in our culture, in our Christian culture, the same misconception that this rich young ruler had that, that thinks something like this. If, if I just have more good things in my life than the bad things that I do, if I can just tip the scales of justice, and if I can end my life with more good things than bad things, then I'm going to heaven and I'll be okay. And that is not the reality at all. The Bible does not say that. There's an extra scripture, James 2.10. You may want to write it in your, in your site. For those of you that study the Bible, go look up James 2.10. He says this, whoever keeps the whole, y'all, the whole law yet fails at one point is guilty of it all. Ay, ay, ay. In other words, if you break one part of the law, you fall into this category that the Bible calls a lawbreaker and you are guilty of the whole thing. There is, listen to me, I just, I want you to get a clear picture of the gospel today. There is no amount of good things that you can do that can tip the scales in your favor. It is only by putting your faith in Jesus Christ that you are saved through grace, that you can have transformation and eternal life. It's the wrong question. What good things do I need to do now? What good things, Jesus? And Jesus continues the story. He says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. And if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Notice that word life. It's just a little like, just it's inserted in there. But I think it's so important that you would see Jesus' intentional words here. If you want life. You see, Jesus did not, did not die to make bad people good. Jesus died to make dead people alive. He says, look, if you want, if you want this life, if you, what you're asking for is, is life, you need to be made alive. And the Bible says that we were dead in our transgressions, in our sin, and our spirit was dead, and it was made alive. It had this newness of life through Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then he continues. He says, the rich young girl goes, okay, wait, which, which, which commandments then? Jesus replied, okay, let me give it to you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then check this out. The rich young Euler says, check, 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 check. I've done it all. I've, I've done all these. I, I've kept them, the young man said. What do I still lack? What's very interesting to me, interesting to me in this story is that Jesus does not correct that statement. 
that he did all these things. So what we're talking about here, you guys, is probably the most religious person in the entire Bible who like, and if it's true that he never at all did anything wrong, even if that's true, here's the problem. You can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. Good, look, uh, the, the goodness is not the absence of badness. I think this is something that has been like a great mistake of the church at large is we focus so much on the sins of commission. So the things that, hey, don't do this and don't do that and you'll be okay. All right, okay. But, but what about the sins of omission? The things we should have, could have, or would have done. Listen, the potential is God's gift to you. Um, but, but what you do with it is your gift back to God. Right. So let me bring it closer to home, you guys. I just don't think that God's ultimate purpose for your life is to come to church for 70 minutes and think you're good to go. That's, right. That's what we're talking about in this series, this all-in challenge, because you can go to church your entire life and never go all in with Jesus. This guy right here, he was following all the rules, but not following Jesus. So that's my question to you today. Are you following the rules or are you following Jesus? Are you following him? If you're, not, if you're following the rules, then eventually you're going to ask the same question that this guy's asking. What, what am I missing? What's missing in my, in my life? Is there anything else that's next? Because following the rules, you're going to ask that question. Religion has to do about rules. But Jesus is, is inviting us into a relationship. Every single one of us, he's inviting us into a relationship with him. This rich young ruler, he was, he was rich, you guys. His net worth labeled him as such. He was, he was rich, okay? He had assets and he had holdings. And, and what I'm saying here is that he could have Leverage his wealth for so much good for the kingdom of God. He, he could have leveraged it. He was powerful, so he had influence, and he could have leveraged that influence and written a letter of recommendation or caused certain doors to be open because of his influence and the power he had. He would have got the gospel into people's, into people's ears that these disciples would have never been able to do. And he was young. He had all the time in the world, and here he is. He misses it entirely. If you're taking notes, you may want to write this one down. Look, everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the bottom line here, you guys. So at the end of the day, Jesus answered this and says, if you want to be perfect, if that's your goal, you want to be perfect, if that's what you're striving for, that's who you're running after, perfection of yourself, okay, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Let's be honest, you guys. Have you ever felt bad for the rich young ruler right here? Come on, that's hard, man. I'm like, oh. If I was there, and I was like, by Jesus, one of the disciples, I'd probably pull Jesus aside at this moment. You know, I'd be that idiot. Like, come on, Jesus, come over here. Are you sure you want to start with every? How about we start with the tithe? Come on, Jesus, just 10%. I mean, everything Jesus, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. This famous rich young ruler, where did he find his identity in? Where did, yeah, exactly. Where did he find his security in? He was all about wealth, power, and Jesus knew that if he didn't give those things up, that he would never find the abundant life that was offered in a relationship with him. See, I don't care how much money you have in the bank or or what you have in this, what this world has to offer, it does not replace or substitute any lacking of your emotional, relational, or spiritual life. Right. It, does, it does not compare, you guys. It can't make up for the experiences that you would miss by following Jesus. So Jesus throws down the gauntlet, man. He says, no, it's all or nothing. Either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's no middle ground here. If you, if you read the Gospels, the Gospel, and you read the Bible, you cannot come away with any other, um, any other end result. Following, following Jesus is an all or nothing proposition. Lordship is an all or nothing proposition. And you know what? Jesus loved this man far too much for, to ask for anything less. And he loves you far too much to ask for anything less then all of you for all of him. And that's, that's the exchange. All of you for all of me. Listen, Jesus died on the cross. We certainly can carry ours, church. 
He, he, he died for us. We can live for him. See, most people spend their life accumulating the wrong things. Just gathering the wrong, like, like whoever has the most toys wins. Whoever has the most stored away wins. No, actually, you're probably going to lose if that's the goal. If that's the goal, you probably are going to lose this thing called, this game called life. Look, I have not met a lot of people. I've met some. I haven't met a lot of people possessed by demons. I've met some, but not, not a lot of people possessed by demons. But I have sure met a lot of people possessed by their possession, possessions. Where they don't own things, things own them. You know what? This guy had a lot of toys at the end of the game. But I promise you, he was empty inside. And I, and I have to think about the time where maybe he became the rich old ruler much, many, many years later on his deathbed. And, and I imagine that day when he had everything and realized it was actually nothing. It was all meaningless. And I think at that moment, he was probably filled with regret that he didn't take up Jesus on this amazing offer that he was given. Please hear me in this, you guys. Your greatest assets can become your greatest liability if you don't use them for God's purposes. Amen. You hearing me, church? The very thing that God gave you to leverage for his kingdom can become the noose around your neck if you do not use it for God's purposes. I know I'm preaching good. You would say amen. You're probably saying amen inside or ouch or something like that. I wanna, I'm going to keep going, though, because I like it. God isn't, okay, God isn't looking for good behavior. We think that. The rich young ruler thinks that. He's, he's, not, he's not looking for that at all. Jesus says, come follow me to the young man. He heard this and went away sad because he had great wealth. Here's, here's a second reason. I think thing that we think that God wants, he doesn't really want, but here it is. God wants me to believe. Now, that statement alone is, is yes, that's a true statement alone, but, but where, where I think we get it wrong is where we stop there. Because here, check it out. This rich young ruler, listen, believed. That's why he followed all the commandments. That's why he was following all the rules, because he believed in, in God. That's why he called Jesus teacher, teacher. He begins, teacher, what do, I, what do I need to do? He believed. It wasn't his belief that was the problem at all. The problem was that it stopped there. James says it this way in chapter 2, verse 19. You say that you have faith, for you believe. Oh, you believe in Jesus? Great. You believe that there is one God? Good for you. <laughs> Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. James is hardcore, man. I love reading James every now and then, because he'll put you straight. James is like, oh, you believe in Jesus? <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. It's, it's, it's the, the, the problem is that it stops there and it doesn't bear any fruit in people's lives. See, in, there was a study that was done in 2015, a, a national poll that was done, and it found that 75% of America identifies themselves as Christian. But if that were really true, then our churches would be full and this world that we live in and the culture that we live in, the society that we live in would be a much different place. Why? Because there's a big gap between belief and doing and acting on, on your belief. See, that's not what Jesus wanted. Jesus didn't want, Jesus wanted, he did not want intellectual agreement. That's not what real faith is and that's not necessarily what what God wants. So the disciples, they see this happening. They're, they're standing around and they see the exchange happening and they see the guy like go away sad. And the story picks up in Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples that are standing there, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It just is. Those possessions have a way of grabbing hold. You start getting focused on the wrong things. And he says, again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Wow. The disciples heard this and they were greatly astonished and said, that sucks. Man, well, who, if that guy didn't do it, I mean, that guy was a religious dude, followed all the rules, did all the commandments. He had wealth and he was young and he had power and influence. Who in the world then can be 
saved? How does this thing even work then? What does God want? All right, capstoning this series, I want to be extremely clear on what the gospel is and what God is inviting you to and asking from us when he says, come follow me. Number one, that's what he wants. Number one, God wants you to follow him. That's what God wants. He wants you to follow him. He doesn't want you to follow a list of rules. He doesn't want you to just attend a church. He doesn't want you to measure up. He wants you to come away with him. Step out of that from whatever you're in, the culture you're in, the things you're in, the scenes you're in. Come out of that, no matter what it is, whether it was fishing or tax collecting it was, no matter what it was. For this man, yeah, he, he was richer than most, but the, but the call was the same. Leave your nets and follow me. Leave extorting people, Matthew, and tax collecting, and which was a wealthy game in their day. Leave it and follow me. Hey, Rich Young. This guy was getting the invitation to be the 13th disciple of Jesus, which when we think of it that way, it changes the whole way we interpret the, the, that passage. Look at it again in Matthew chapter 19, 21. We look at this verse and we feel bad for the rich young ruler. We're like, ay, 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 that's a, wow, I don't know if I could do that. So look at it again. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And that's where we go, ooh, that's where we focus. But we miss the second part. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow. The reason why we feel bad for him is because we're focusing on what Jesus asked, not what Jesus offered. And Jesus offered treasures in heaven, Jesus offered this man an amazing seat at an awesome table, the 13th disciple. Come and follow me. Come and get a front row seat to the miracles, signs, and wonders that you will see performed on heaven as it, as it, in heaven as it is on earth, you guys. Come and see. Come and follow. Come and look at me and watch with me and learn from me and eat with me. Man, we focus on what he asked for and not what he was giving and what Jesus offered in this moment is an abundant life, is one full of more power, more love, more hope, more peace than we could ever muster up or create on our own strength and power. The man looked at Jesus' offer, and he said, what you're offering is less than what I have. He didn't know. He didn't know what he was giving up. And very, a lot of us are at different stages of following we're at different stages of, of like what it looks like to follow Jesus. And discovery is a place, and we always like to say this, man. Discovery is a place where you can investigate your faith, where you can figure out this whole faith thing, Jesus thing, God thing, Bible thing. Feel free to, to you belong here. You can do that. You can be safe here. Ain't no one going to judge you or twist your arm or anything like that. But all of us are at different stages of our walk with Jesus and and uh, Rick Warren, who's a, a pastor in, in Southern California, wrote a book. You guys have maybe read it, The Purpose Driven Life. And he actually created this, this diagram that I want to show you. It, just, it, it shows the stages of following Jesus that most of us fall into. And it's shown by, by circles. And, and from the outer circle to this inner circle of being all in with God, we're all at different stages of being on the outer circle to all in with God. I just want to show you because everyone fits into one of these categories. The first category that he says that people fall into is what he, what he calls the community. And those are the people that are kind of outside of the, the voice of and the presence of Jesus. They are people who may have heard uh, about Jesus, but they're in a different town. They're not coming. They're not, they don't have nothing to do with Jesus. They don't want to. There are people in our city that may, you know, don't have any idea about discovery at all, which is so cool. It's almost everywhere I go now, people know. Like you're inviting someone that they know, know, comes to Discovery, and it's amazing. It's really cool. But these are people that are on the outside. That next category, that next step is what he calls the crowd. And those are people that like when Jesus was around in their area, in the vicinity, they're going to come. They're going to come. They're going to be part of the large crowd. So they like the teaching. They like the inspiration. They like the scene. They like the donuts. They... They like the vibe. They like the inspiration. I like to feel good. So I'm in that crowd level. I'm going to come around when it's convenient, when you're in my scene, because I like the inspiration that I feel. And so many people are in that category. They're just kind of, you're kind of in the crowd. You're in the crowd. And that's where you're at in following Jesus. But that next step to closer to Jesus is what he calls the congregation. Those are people that said, I'm going where Jesus goes. 
I'm, I'm, wherever he's teaching, I'm, I'm going to go. So those would be like the church. It's the church. Like this is, this is my church. I'm going to be here, man. I love, I love it. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I want more. But, but this, listen, Jesus did not die so you can go to church. Following Jesus is not about you going to a church or committing to a church. As much as I love church and I, I'm a pastor and I love church, that's not what it's all about. That's not what it means to go all in. That all in next step for some of you is what we call committed and that's what we've been talking about in this series is to fully commit. The biblical word is consecrate yourself. Fully devote, fully commit yourself to God. Go all in, leave nothing out. Say, God, I'm all yours. Look, that's what Christianity is. That's what it means to follow Jesus truly. And you can be at any one of these stages and you're still figuring out, I get it, but I just want to tell you this. You, have, you feel free to take the steps that you need to take at the pace you need to take it, but I want you to know it was never intended to work that way. Like, like your faith in Christianity and this thing following Jesus doesn't work unless you're all the way in the center, unless you're fully devoted, your whole heart given to God. God wants you to follow him. Here's the second thing God wants. God wants you to hear from him. God wants you to hear from him. He wants you to be close enough to him, the reason why he said, he's a come follow me, come out of that, come follow me, so that you can hear his voice. And hearing God is not for a select few, church. Hearing God is not for a certain pastors or, or people that are extremely holy, that just spend their all day praying and meditating. No, God is a spirit, the Bible says. And those who worship him, worship in spirit and truth. And God wants to speak to your spirit being inside of you. He wants to lead and guide you. He wants you close enough that you would hear his voice, that you would hear him lead and guide you. Come, follow me. I, wanna, I got some things to say. I want to speak to you. I don't know if you've ever got a phone call. You probably have. Everyone here gets certain phone calls that all you need to hear is one word, and you know who that person is. You have those people that, that are in your life. All it takes is my wife to say one word to me, and I know it, that's my wife speaking, and you have that because re recognition um, takes familiarity. And familiarity is by time spent together. See, if you want to recognize the voice of God, you have to get away with him to be able to recognize the voice of God in your life. Matthew 19, 22, it says that the young man, he was close enough to hear, but still he went away sad. He went away sad because he, he thought that what he had was greater than what he was being offered. So the rich young ruler was probably in the crowd, maybe even in the congregation, and he's, you know, he, he's thinking, I'll be a good person. I'll follow the rules. And uh, I want my children to be good adults and follow the rules. So I'm going to be a good example. And I'm going to take my kids to the congregation too. And we're just going to, and I'm going to be a good example. And we're going to be a part of the congregation. And that's my gift to God. You know, so many people, like this, this, this guy called Jesus teacher, yet he did not want to learn anything really. So many people show up to church, and I hope I'm not hurting your feelings too much, church. They show up to the congregation, and we call Jesus teacher, but we don't want to change anything. We don't want to learn anything. God wants you to hear him, but this guy heard him. He just, that's why, that's why there's a third thing. Here's the third thing that God wants you to do. God wants you to not only hear him, he wants you to respond to him. He wants you to respond to his voice. And listen to me, how you respond to God determines how God responds to you. Okay, however you determine, wherever you're ready to step into, God will reciprocate that. God, God will. So you read the story of the, the prodigal son. The prodigal son says, give me my inheritance. I wanna, I wanna do what I wanna do with it. And God goes, all right, kid. That's you, okay, kid, here you go. He didn't stop him. He didn't go chase after him. He said, all right, that's what you want. Go ahead, go out there. He's, and all he did was sit in the porch and wait. And wait. However you respond to God determines how he will respond to you. It's not just about hearing God, but responding. John chapter 10, Jesus says this, that my sheep, they don't just hear, they listen. There's a difference, right, to hear and listen, your kids might hear you, but they ain't listening to you, do they? They heard you when you said, make your bed or do the chore or whatever it was, but they ain't listening to you. Jesus says, my sheep, they don't just hear me, they listen to my voice. And I know them. And they do what? They follow 
me. See, Jesus is inviting you to a new, a new life. That's what this follow. It's not, it's not just a better life. It's not a refurbished life. It's not a improved life. He's inviting us to a new life, a new creation. So let me pick up this story here um, from where Peter, you know, Jesus says, not even a camel can, you know, you know, get through the eye of the needle so hard for a rich man to answer. And he says, who then can be saved? And then we pick up the story in verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. See, this, this statement is true in a lot of contexts, and we use it in a lot of contexts. It's true. With God, all things are possible. Well, what's interesting, though, is that the context of this was talking about your soul, your salvation. Hey, you can't be good enough to save yourself. There is no amount of good that you can. You can't with, with you, but with you, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Peter answered to him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will be for us? Like Peter's like, oh man, we put all of our chips in. Jesus, we went all in. We left the net. We left the business. We left the family. We left it all and we went all in. Did we make the right decision, Jesus? This is sounding different to me. So Jesus tells them, he assures them, which I want to assure you today. I want to make the same statement. Jesus says, look, hey, I know you went all in. Truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, he's talking about that day, the judgment day, at the end time day. He said, you will have followed me, will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm not going to get into Revelation with you and end time study stuff, but these disciples will actually have a, a high seat at the table of end times. They will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But then he says something to every single one of us. He said, and everyone, everyone, not just the disciples, but everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields, whatever it is that you possess, for my sake, you went all in. Here's what you're going to receive a hundred times as much. And not only that, you'll inherit eternal life. So you want to know what God wants? Is this exchange Worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what does God want? Write it down this way. God wants, he wants your whole heart. He doesn't want your things. He doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't want your behavior. He wants your whole heart. Jeremiah says it like this. God, prophetically speaking, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So in this series, give me just a couple more minutes, you guys. I'm going to land this in a moment. In this series, in part one, we talked about that, that guy who got the invitation. And he said, he said, oh, but first, but first I got to take care of some things. I got to handle this. And, and we do that with God. That's, a, that's our priorities. Some of us, the reason why we don't accept the invitation to come follow me is because our priorities, other things are first. They're robbing that place that God was designed for in your life and in your heart and in your commitments. We have the but first excuses. In part two, we talked about Nicodemus, where it was about, he didn't follow because of the people in places that he was in. He was, he was around important people in good places, and he didn't want to leave those people or places to follow Jesus. And that may be where some of you are at today. Maybe it's your priorities. Maybe it's the people you're around, the places and scenes that you're in that prevents you from following Jesus. But today, this rich young ruler, it was not because of his his priorities, the people or places, it was because of his possessions. His possessions, his things, the earthly treasures prevented him. I don't know, that all in, I don't know. The exchange don't look too good, Jesus. Eternal life, you know, follow you, but I got a lot of stuff. And a lot of people don't make the exchange to go all in because of the stuff. Why is this important? Why did Jesus lay down the gauntlet like that? Why? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hey, you want to know, you want to know if your heart is with God, if your heart is in an eternal thing? It's really easy. Jesus says, it's really easy to find out. Follow your money. Wherever you put your treasure and your money, he says, that's where your heart will be also. See, some of you, your heart is in your home because that's where all your treasure and money is. Some of your heart is in your hobbies, because that's where it's all is. Some of your, your heart, you park it in your 
garage maybe, or it's in a cabin, it's in a car, it's in a bank account. Wherever people put their money, Jesus says that's where your heart will go. See, your investment leads, your heart follows. Your heart follows whatever you invest in. You inv- wherever you are investing in, your heart follows. See, if people want to get involved in Coca-Cola company and they buy some stocks in Coca-Cola company, they start looking at the stock market of how the Coca-Cola company is trading and doing. But if you don't got no stocks, you ain't looking at the market. You're not looking at Coca-Cola. It's the same thing with God. If, if you want your to... When you invest into eternity, and you will start weighing your decisions in your life based upon the investment you have made in eternity. Wherever your treasure is, Jesus says, your heart will be also. Where you put your money and time, it reveals a lot about your priorities. I mean, you say you love Jesus, but how much time do you spend with, like, with Jesus? I mean, do you, if you looked at that, do you really love him like you think you love him? I'm going to get real with you guys. You thought, okay, is this real now? Okay. You say you love your kids, but you don't spend any time with your kids. Do you love your kids like you think you love your kids? You say you love to be in shape, but you don't work out. Do you? Maybe you don't love to be in shape like you think you love to be in shape. Hey, this is, this, is, this is just one of those barriers Jesus addressed here to, to following him. He said it's hard. That's why he laid down the gauntlet, because he said it's the exchange. All of me for all of you, it's nothing less. So here at Discovery, we created this thing called the 90-Day Tide Challenge to help us in this area, because it is something very cultural, very cultural. It's something that inhibits us from going all in. In your seat back in front of you, on the left side, there's a card that looks like this. You can take it out and read that. The 90-Day Tide Challenge, it's a... It's a three-month tithe challenge. Basically what it is, it comes out of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It reads like this. This is God's challenge to us. He actually challenged us. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's the 10%. The first 10% belongs to God. So that there may be food in my house, that the things of God can happen and continue to happen. And then he says this, test me in this. And that's the only place in the Bible that God invites you to test him. No other place are we, are we commanded to, and actually we're told not to test. Do not put the Lord to test. But God says, here's an area I want you to be able to test because possessions can become a possessing thing in your life. So I want to test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room for you to store it. So here's the the tithe challenge. The tithe challenge is this. Test God for 90 days. Give tithe. Give your tithe. And this, honestly, this is not for anyone who's a visitor or a guest. This is, for some of you, this is your next step and you know it. You're somewhere within those circles. Maybe you're in the congregation. Maybe you're in the crowd. And you want to be committed to Jesus. And you want to go all in. This is for you if you want to go all in. No arm twisting. This is just, this is the, the challenge. Do it for 90 days. And at the end of 90 days, if you are not If God's not faithful to this word that he says that you'll be more blessed, we'll refund your 90 days worth of tithes. No questions asked. We'll write you a check, send it to you, okay? In in, in the three years that we've been doing this, there has never been anybody that says God has not been faithful. The worship leader, Drew, some of you guys know Drew Martin. He took the 90-day tithe challenge, first started 10 years ago, and he was a salesman back then. Now he's a business owner. Uh, I'm just, there's so many testimonies. I have one of them here. It's from Sal. Saldana, and some of you guys know Sal, he says, I've been coming to Discovery for about five years. I decided to take the 90-day tithe challenge for a purpose. It was always a dream of mine to build my own home from scratch, and I stepped out in faith in early November 2018 to do so. Once I made the decision to go all in and to make the 90-day tithe challenge and give with a purpose, I started seeing open doors. I would receive checks unexpectedly, and I was given the opportunity to receive overtime at work. I believe that God blessed me and really provided me with the opportunity to purchase a house because of my decision to go all in. There has been testimony after testimony after testimony of just God's faithfulness in this area of of our life. And here's here's why. You want to say, why? Why? This is why. God says the purpose of the tithe is not to pay for things. We don't tithe to keep the lights on and keep 
you know, pay pastor's salaries. And no, 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 guys, we don't tithe for that stuff. That's not why you tithe, okay? The purpose of tithing is to teach us to always put God first. That is why we give. It is a principle of priority. And for some of you, that's where you're at. And you know, that's the next step. If it's not, don't worry. You just continue to follow God. No one's twisting your arm. You continue to do what God leads you to do, convicts you to do, is inviting you to do at the pace that Jesus is doing that. Here, let me close with this scripture in Philippians chapter three. It says, Paul writing to this church in Philippi, he says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. They may not want to be, but they are. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. They have idols in their life that they're living for. And their glory is in their shame because their mind is so fixated on the, thing this wor- the things this world has to offer, on earthly things, but not us, Discovery Church. I'm call- he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. We don't live for this world. We're, our, our treasures are not in this world. Our, citizen- ci- our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I left a little bit of a blank spot on the bottom of your, of your notes. And I want you to write in something if you're ready. If you're ready, only if you're ready. And I've been telling you to do this every week to mark the day and go all in and give God a year of your life. If you're new and that's the first time you're hearing that challenge, I want to make it to you. Mark this day on your calendar and give God one year and go all in. In your priorities, your people, your places, your possessions, everything. Just go all in with God and just see if it's not a hundred times better. Not only is it eternal life are we given it's better. It is better. So if that, and you're ready, if you're ready for that on the bottom, I want you to write something like this. I'm going all in. And as you write that, it's your commitment to God. I'm going all in. Write that down and let me pray for you. Go ahead and bow your heads all across this worship center. God, I thank you.